Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar that will review the Federal Reduction of Lead in Drinking Water Act, answer your questions, and offer suggestions as to how distributors can comply with the legislation, as well as understand how it will impact your customers. Please note that this webinar is being recorded for replay. Everyone registered for this webinar will receive a follow-up email message with notification as to when the replay is available, as well as instructions on how to access it and the presentation slides. I'm Chris Murin, Executive Director of the Midwest Distributors Association and the American Supply Association. And before we get underway, I'd like to remind everyone that one of our strategic goals is that ASA will be the recognized voice of the industry as it pertains to legislative initiatives, regulatory compliance, workforce advancement, political intelligence, and employee safety in the workplace. Since 2010, Dan Hilton has been a member of the ASA staff representing your interests full-time on Capitol Hill as our Director of Government Affairs. Thanks to support from MWDA as well as individual members, Dan works every day on your behalf meeting with members of Congress and their staffs, collaborates with numerous stakeholders allied with our interests, including the Get the Let Out Consortium, and engages individual MWDA and ASA members directly on specific issues, as well as with his weekly e-letter, Washington Weekly. It's now my pleasure to introduce our presenter for this morning, John Kirkland, Vice President of Sales for Legend Valve. John will present this morning's webinar on behalf of the Get the Let Out Consortium, a team of industry professionals who are actively promoting outreach in the form of training and marketing initiatives to help the industry transition and comply with the lead-free legislation including interpretation, manufacturing issues, and installation. John will also be sure to review key differences between federal and state no lead mandates, as well as language to be added to Section 1417 of the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act. He'll also share some important information about standards and codes, no lead alloys and soldering materials, as well as product identification and enforcement. Now before I turn it over to John, I want to make sure that everybody is clear he or she is encouraged to ask questions throughout this presentation. While it would likely be very difficult to have all of us on a conference call, your go-to webinar control panel includes window panes or boxes in which you may post questions and even chat with other participants through the use of your computer's keyboard. These panes are labeled chat and questions. I'll help John to monitor the control panel for your questions and periodically he'll ask us if we have any for him. By the way, you can minimize and maximize the GoToWebinar control panel by clicking on the orange arrow in the upper left-hand corner, as this will make it easier for you to see the entire presentation slides. John, take it away. Thank you, Chris. Just want to call to everybody's attention that uh, at the very bottom of your screen is the website address for the Get the Let Out Plumbing Consortium. Uh, from there, you can find an, an, an extended version of this presentation, which encapsulates what we would present to the uh, certifying bodies such as ASPE who are doing a, who are writing a specifics relative to coding. Uh, you'll find this presentation will also be geared to distributors as yourself as well as contractors. So again, visit the site. There's information there about the history of the consortium as well as the presentation uh, for full viewing as well as frequently asked questions. Just want to identify the consortium partners to each and every one of you. Those that have contributed to this presentation and the efforts to help further the cause within the industry as it relates to knowledge of the federal uh, no lead laws would be the American Society of Plumbing Engineers, ASPE, the American Supply Association, the ASA, the International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical Official Officials, IATMA, the International Codes Council, the ICC, Legend Valve, whom I'm employed with, Milwaukee Valve, NIPCO, the Plumbing, Heating, Cooling Contractors Association, National, the PHCC, the Plumbing, Heating, Cooling Contractors Association Education Foundation within the PHCC, the PMI, Plumbing Manufacturers International, Reliance Worldwide, Inviga, LLC, and last, Watts Water Technologies. Chris has covered part of this, uh, so I'm going to jump to paragraph two because he's covered the first early in the uh, intro. The presentation is for information purposes only and is not intended to be legal advice. Should any party need legal advice regarding information contained herein, they should contact their own counsel who specializes in this area of law. The reason why this is stated is much of this is open to interpretation and the association can't be responsible for how that is interpreted by each and every one of you. The consortium will not enter in any discussions related to product, material selection, distribution, 
or pricing of lead-free plumbing products in accordance with the established antitrust guidelines. An overview of today's presentation. First will be the law and its background. Second will be interpretation uh, issues relevant to the law. Manufacturing issues surrounding the development of new lead-free products would be three. Installation considerations for properly installing new lead-free products. And last, preparing for implementation of this law. First, we'd like to discuss the federal lead-free law which is entitled Reduction of Lead in Drinking Water Act. The timeline for this bill, it was signed into law on January 4, 2011, with an implementation date of January 4, 2014. Keep in mind as we scroll through the definition and we define what this, uh, what this is spelling out to each and every one of you, everything is with respect to installation date, not about inventory, installation date of compliant product. This amends the Safe Drinking Water Act. The amended definition of lead-free is provided in two ways. First will be the max lead for solder and flux, which is 0.20% max or less. Second would be the 0.25% max lead for products by weighted average. Weighted average can be, uh, can be interpreted as follows. It can be a confusing definition. Before I read it to you, I'll describe it to you. Essentially what's being measured is the water that comes directly in contact with the surface area of the valve or materials such as fittings that are being used for distribution of potable water. This is the definition. The multiple component products are calculated to address total weighted exposure based upon wetted surface. Let me emphasize wetted surface area of each component and that component's lead content by percentage. The takeaway from this slide is this. There are two categories here. One would be for solder flux. The second would be for all other products. There are exemptions to the federal law. Uh, some of these will be clearly understood. Others will be in question. But this is, in fact, what is published in the law. And this is what you have to go with and interpret from. Exemptions are identified as the following. Pipe, pipe fittings, plumbing fixtures, or, or fixture fittings or fixtures, including backflow preventers, that are used exclusively for non-potable services, such as manufacturing, industrial processing, irrigation, outdoor water, or any other uses where the water is not anticipated, anticipated to be used for human consumption. The key takeaway here is anticipated for human consumption. This has nothing to do with the threading of the valve, whether it be IPS, uh, in the FIP or an MIP or a solder connection. The definition is water is not anticipated to be used for human consumption. These are obvious except for one. Toilets, bidets, urinals, fill valves, flush, flush meter valves, tub fillers, shower valves, service saddles, or water, di water distribution main gate valves that are two inches or larger. The obvious here would be the, the service saddles and the water distribution main gates, which obviously are delivering potable water. Uh, those are, however, in the exemption list. There are key differences between state and federal laws, starting with California, Vermont, Maryland, and Louisiana. This applies to any product intended to convey or dispense water for human consumption through drinking or cooking. Again, let me repeat, convey or dispense water for human consumption through drinking or cooking. There is some common uh, bridge work here or commonality between the variations, but again, you'll see what the keys are. Federal. This applies to any product used in systems where water is anticipated to be used for human consumption. Federal law wording could be interpreted to cover much broad, a much broader group of products than state laws. I would leave it in this way. The ease of this to understand would be this. Water for human consumption through drinking or cooking, being California, Vermont, Maryland, Louisiana, and the federal law would be anticipated to be used for human consumption. Again, nothing to do with threading. Or, or for that matter, whether it's a solder, FIP, or MIP connection. Again, this applies to exactly what we've just covered on this slide and the previous slide. As it pertains to uh, certifications and what you're going to look for to ensure that you are selling a compliant product as of January 4th, 2014, you're going to see three different subsets here, or one core, which is NSF 61G 
To your left, you're going to see NSF-61, and then finally to the right, 372. NSF-61, to your left, evaluates all potential contaminants from drinking water products. These contaminants are set for the baseline for what the allowable would be by the EPA. So that would be one category. To your far right would be the NSF-372, which evaluates products for weighted average lead content, which is 0.25% or less. Together, looking for one singular listing, you would find NSF-61G, which is what we're telling you right now is the ideal, not the ideal listing that you're going to look for in any product that you're marketing for that needs to be of a compliant nature. This evaluates both contaminants and weighted average lead content, grouping this under one roof or one easy to remember uh, certification. One area that could offer uh, confusion each and every one of you based upon what we've just discussed would be, what about these third-party agency options? Are there other companies that are certifying to the NSF ANSI 61G standard? There are, and these companies are certified through NSF to do so. Obviously, we've covered NSF, and again, there are accredited agencies, Truesdale Labs, UL, WQA, IATMO, CSA, Intertech, ICC Evaluation Service. Again, these are accredited agencies that can provide certification and listing to NSF ANSI 61G. Again, the vendor partners you do business will be able to spell this out for you and identify that these certifying bodies are working in accordance with, the, uh, with NSF. Enforcement seems to be the uh, number one question, who's going to enforce the law? We're going to state the obvious. Um, much of this is still open to uh, development in the uh, out is what I would deem to be the trenches, whether it be the inspectors, the plumbing contractors, but this is how it works. The EPA implements the law. Enforcement is left to the states. Most states pass responsibility to counties, cities, towns, and municipal utilities who use health and plumbing codes to drive enforcement. California being the exception here where they would require a third party uh, from an, indep an independent third party. Again, as you talk to these, uh, these inspectors at the local level and the plumbing contractors, many of them are void of information. Many of them are at the very earliest of stages of gathering information as it relates to this. We as part of our industry, a very important part, can be a bridge to provide this knowledge to all, all different as facets of our industry to help educate and inform and bridge this knowledge. Manufacturing issues, um, there have been many. For those that have, uh, have already made the transition uh, directly over to a no letter or a compliant product, maybe some of you have seen some of the challenges where we're not allowed to talk price specifically. Certainly you've been impacted in that area. There are other areas where maybe pop product may very well not be readily available to you for this transition. We're going to talk about each of those. We're going to try to give you an understanding because this knowledge will need to be passed into the field so that your customer base understands what you're dealing with on the supply side. Alloy comparisons. We want to talk about lead-free, bronze, brass, and I'm going to elaborate on each of these. More difficult to cast. The key here with, as it's relative to the casting is the lead component. Lead provides uh, ease of machining. is covered in topic two there, harder to machine. It also makes it easier to cast. It fills voids in casting as well. So it's an, in, it's an integral part of any one alloy, as you'll see, and taking that away created a whole host of challenges for every manufacturer, such as faster machine toolware. Because of the hardness of the alloy, the ability to machine the product was very is very challenging. In many cases, many manufacturers had difficulty bringing product to market due to the fact that there were challenges with chipping of alloy, uh, whether it be a cast bronze or, for that matter, a forged brass alloy, because of the difficulty due to the hardness. Harder to press, that would try directly to forging alloys, meaning that pressing a brass, brass alloy became that much more difficult. Stress cracks in the alloy could consist, and many other facets of the machining process and the uh, finished product development were very, very difficult to work with. Fitting design accommodates increased hardness, and we're dealing with the same working pressures, whether it be lead-free or leaded. Alloy comparison continued, standard bronze, uh, brass. Again, this is what you're currently uh, 
in the non-compliant category, traditional plumbing material, stronger than copper, minimal erosion and corrosion, used for adapters and transitions. This would contain, contain lead. The lead-free bronze brass would be of a 0.25% lead or less. Lead, re, lead is replaced with bismuth or silicon. It's a harder material and minimal erosion and corrosion. Much of what you're, not going, what you're going to see here is not a whole lot different than what you're accustomed to dealing with. However, each and every installation application needs to be reviewed because the alloys are, in fact, different than what you're currently using in the field. Equipment, many manufacturers have added equipment to, uh, to test for the alloys to ensure because the liability associated with uh, the potential risk of lead being an alloy and the legality associated with that. To your upper right hand side of your screen, you're seeing a mass spectrometer. Uh, this allows for testing of an alloy to determine exactly what the makeup of that alloy is. Many companies have these currently uh, on site in their, uh, in their facilities and doing testing of all products that they're shipping or cross-checking alloys is their receipt for manufacturing. Types of lead-free solutions. Uh, please keep in mind that when we talk about these alloys, new alloys are currently being developed. So uh, one that's not on this list that we'll highlight at the very end is, a, uh, is, is one that's brand new. But the initial ones that you're seeing in the field, and for those that have already started to bring compliant product into stock, these are primarily what you're faced with, or at least the ones we're knowledgeable of. Silicon copper-based alloys, uh, many know the name Eco-Brass, that would tie directly to, the, to that particular alloy. Uh, bismuth copper alloys, um, depending on the application, there is not one that's, uh, that's ideal over the other. However, depending on who you're working with and the application the product's being installed with, you may be steered one direction or, or honestly one other direction based upon the install. Lastly would be the binary alloy, which is a very very close to a traditional forging alloy. That's brand new. We're seeing that surface with uh, many overseas manufacturers because of the ease of machining and the ease of forging. Again, many alloys are available and more are being developed. Of course, there are products that are naturally lead-free. Uh, most of them are quite obvious to each and every one of us. The plastics will be one. Secondly, stainless steel would fall into that category as a, as a lead-free product. Installation, uh, are there challenges associated with installing uh, lead-free products? Uh, the only one that comes to mind, or at least that we've discussed or we've experienced at Legend or has been discussed by the consortium would be soldering. And when it comes to uh, the soldering of a no-lead product, it can vary based upon the alloy, but in some instances there have been, been notes through customers that, uh, that the silicon-based alloy is a little more challenging, which would in fact require a... Uh, you know, you're using a water-soluble flux, which I should have mentioned earlier, which is an ASTM B813. That's a flux that can be washed directly through the system in the initial purging of it. That is a requirement under this, under this law. During the install or soldering of a valve, it's critical that the heat be distributed evenly around the valve to help, to help create the capillary effect where the solder itself will flow evenly around. So you're working the solder in and around that joint. Adequate flux, of course, and what I would recommend would be traditional preparation that they're already doing typically for any one solder install that they're, uh, they're currently involved with, which is a, a good, solid, clean joint where they're using a good, uh, good sand cloth or an emery cloth, as well as uh, the necessary fitting brush tools to clean all fittings. Other than that, the solder, uh, critical there also that we talk about a, uh, a no-let solder, which is a 95.5, or S we're moving up the ladder into a silver bearing solder. Things that can help uh, with, uh, with soldering with no lead alloys. Silver bearing solders, when compared to traditional, traditional solders in the 95.5 category, have a much wider working range, meaning that the solder will melt and be workable throughout a joint at a wider variation of temperature. They're friendlier to work with, they're easier to work with, and many of the contractors that you currently sell to have already used a silver bearing solder in the past and quite honestly have learned to uh, like that much better than any other option they've had. So silver bearing solders can be of a real benefit to the installing contractor. Lead free product identification examples, packaging and body markings. Consistent here is inconsistency. There is nothing, nothing uh, stated in the law that indicates as to how a valve or any fitting for that matter 
needs to be marked. It has to be marked, but there's no specific way of doing so. In this slide, you'll see variations as to how no lead product can be marked. To your upper right-hand side would be, the, would be the symbol for lead, which is a PB. In this case, to indicate that it is a no lead alloy, it carries a circle as well as a line over the PB to, uh, to indicate that that is, in fact, a lead-free alloy. Some of them may very well not make sense or have a complete uh, synergy to what a lead-free definition would be, such as the triangles or, for that matter, a circle with a check mark or a solid triangle. But the obvious is this. The, word, the, the, the letters NL for no lead, LF for no lead are pretty synonymous and very, very popular throughout the industry. PB would probably be with the line, the circle and the line would be number three in the list. But again, every valve or fitting has to be marked. And in all cases, many manufacturers are taking extra effort to, uh, to mark product as it relates to the packaging of it, whether it be an inner box or a master carton quantity. A few examples are noted below. In this case, the uh, letters PB, which is the definition for lead, are circled and marked through. We have two slides under preparing for the law, and uh, obviously we're dealing with the distributor base today for this presentation, but um, much of what the preparation is involved with is, is the customer base that you sell to. So we're going to cover both areas. Uh, your knowledge that you can impart on your customer base may protect you financially as a result of materials that they could inevitably want to return at year's end. Preparing for lead-free. This is for distributors, our first slide. An action plan needs to be developed. And many of you already started this. Many have started the conversion process. For those that haven't, the way I recommend or personally recommend through the consortium would be this. Each and every item that you currently stock that's being used for potable installation needs to be reviewed on an individual SKU basis. I've emphasized this, that companies that view this as a standpoint that if my turns today were at five or six, chances are I've moved that product through the supply chain. That's an average for an overall business. It has to be looked on a turn basis on an individual SKU because the turns vary from high velocity on certain items and your more popular sizes all the way down to slower velocity, which may be the quantities you're currently buying at are excessive relative to the number of turns you get, but you have to carry it because your customers require you to. Our recommendation is an individual SKU analysis, and that's going to that's gonna require even a further analysis to determine what products am I selling that can be used for, will be used in compliant and non-compliant. Non-compliant meaning for, for hydronics potentially or irrigation applications where I don't have to have a compliant valve, which would be, in essence, could create an elevated cost. Reach out to colleagues in states that have already incurred or had to deal with this changeover. Many of them have action plans, whether they've created uh, alternative outlets to uh, move product or had suggestions on how they've approached, because they were before this current date, this federal date, how they've approached the transition to compliant product. Communicate with all affected vendors. Uh, communication is critical in all, all facets, whether it be the distributor, dealing with your customer base, or your vendors. Many of the vendors currently have already, already moved to a compliant product, meaning they no longer offer anything but anything other than a compliant product. Some are doing rolling changes, whereas maybe currently you place a 10-line purchase order only to learn that two of those SKUs are no longer stocked or carried by your manufacturer vendor, and they can only supply you in a lead-free product, which potentially would be affected in a negative way in cost. So keep that, keep that in the uh, front there because each and every one of you are quoting work each and every day, and that could impact you negatively in your margins as well as your, with your customers. Understand the law, the difference between potable and the uh, non-potable. Next, we clearly identify non-compliant product for employees and customers. Again, education is the key. Assess inventory position and begin to, uh, to move non-compliant product through the supply chain and move it out to your customers and obviously educate them so they understand that they've got to perform the same task with their business. Lean on the knowledge base of manufacturers. Many of us in the consortium uh, have worked diligently through ASPE or PHCC or for that matter with ASA today to create, a, to create uh, vehicles where we can share this knowledge and help impart it on 
all, all, vari all various areas within the supply chain to assist and help educate. Educate employees. It's more specifically, identify those in your company that clearly are dealing with your customer base each and every day on a one-on-one -on -one basis. That could be your outside sales personnel, inside sales, or your countermen. They have more direct one-on-one -on -one engagement with your customers than, than many cases those that are working at the, at the higher levels with anyone's, in one of your businesses. So they need to be educated as well, and they need to be instructed as to where we're at with this federal no lead mandate and how much time currently exists for your customers to, uh, to clear their inventories as well. Communicate early and often. Start the conversation today. Gauge their knowledge and explain the law expiring existing bids. I want to comment on that because that's, that's a given that you've got to be careful there. You may want to quote projects with compliant and non-compliant product, also noting to the effect that based upon availability of current non-compliant product before that date of January 4, 2014. So there could be three different possibilities, distinct possibilities here that you have to identify when quoting your customers. The contractors. Much of this is the same, but again, it's critical that we review it. Again, they need to start planning now. We need to ensure that they are clear and they understand the federal law and any state laws that will affect you and know their uh, effective dates. Key questions that contractors ask. What if I start a project today that's going to carry over into 2014? Can I continue to use non-compliant product? The answer to that is there's much open to interpretation here, but it clearly states in the law that this is relative to installation date. So based upon installation date, you are left with that to interpret from, meaning that anything you decide or elect to do as a contractor, you know, you're taking matters into your own hands, and that would have to be, you'd have to have that cleared up with your legal, uh, your legal advisors before doing so. Know, that, know what product categories are included uh, and exempt from the applicable laws. Again, teach them how to learn to identify the product markings and packagings. Confirm manufacturer listing with third-party agencies. They're going to want to do that primarily for those that are the engineers that are spelling out the requirements for jobs that they're working on. Potentially, they could be stuck with non-compliant product. None of us want to see our distributor base or our contractor base stuck with non-compliant products. So again, these are financial setbacks to both of our businesses as well as those that are your, uh, your vendor partners. And lastly, work with suppliers to obtain installation material recommendations and training. There are many avenues to go for, for uh, education and knowledge. The consortium, consortium is actively uh, approaching anyone, any one distributor for that matter, any one contractor to assist and help because uh, the more we prepare the supply chain, the better off the, our industry will be. This concludes my presentation on behalf of the no, Get the Let Out Consortium. I hope it was helpful and uh, I appreciate your time. I'd like to turn the microphone back over to Chris. Thank you, John. We do have uh, several questions that uh, I would like to share with you. Uh, the first one that I'll address is with respect to access to the PowerPoint slides and a replay of the webinar. Um, this, the, 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 this morning's program will be available for replay, meaning the, the advancement of the PowerPoint slides and the audio will be synced together like a, a movie. And uh, in addition, a copy, a PDF copy of the PowerPoint slides will also be available. Uh, because of modern technology, it actually takes a couple days for the file to be downloaded to us and uploaded. So as soon as that information is available, um, I will send an email message to all of you that are participating um, with the information on how to access the slides, the replay, and, and so forth. In the meantime, though, I, I do want to suggest that everybody um, visit uh, the consortium's website, which is uh, gettheletoutplumbing.com. There is uh, some outstanding information contained on those pages. The FAQ um, pages are, are, are a wealth of information. And you'll find uh, a copy of the an expanded, a much longer version of this presentation. What John did this morning is really tailored it um, for the wholesalers in our industry, um, as opposed to uh, the longer presentation, which is geared towards a variety of different audiences. So let me dive into the first, the first of several specific questions, and that is, John, where does potable start? It, does it start at the main? Um, I mean, one could argue that any water that comes into a household um, or uh, you know somebody's office building 
uh, it can be anticipated for, for potable use. So where does the law consider potable to start? Chris, that is a, uh, that's an excellent question. And from there, I'll probably have to uh, plead the fifth to tell you that the, uh, the one and a quarter pages that are spelled out in this federal no lead mandate do not indicate the starting point, nor does it end, indicate the ending point. Uh, it's limited to what we've, uh, what we've discussed in this presentation today, which would be uh, drinking, cooking, or anticipated human consumption. So again, there is no clear boundary for the starting point or the end point for this, whether it relates to specifics outside of what, this, what were discussed in roughly, I think it was slide three, potentially slide four. That's where, from a professional standpoint, from where I sit, um, we've got to err on the side of caution. Anything that we know potentially could be outside of the exemptions, and, and of course I work for a valve and a fitting manufacturer. The only error that directly applies, applies to the products that I represent for the company I work for would be two-inch gate valves or larger. And uh, I'm not necessarily sure why those are exempt. There's no clear definition as to why they were ever considered in the first place, but they are clearly spelled out in the law. And from there, we can take this. Two inch or larger in gate valves, they can be of a non-compliant nature. So again, as Chris asked the question, which is a very, very good one, uh, you're going to have to err on the side of caution. Anything that's not spelled out in the way of exemptions that you know or your customer knows that's going to be used for a potable installation, you've got to err on caution and you've got to, uh, you've got to take all measures next necessary to ensure that you have a compliant product. So and, and another attendee, another participant is asking about hydrants or shower valves. I mean, that conceivably, they could be used for potable uses. And they're not among, they're not among the exemptions, are they? Yeah, shower valves, uh, we just happen to have an associate here that had sold uh, faucets and uh, faucets and fittings in his previous uh, uh, employment. And uh, it's my understanding that the shower valves, because they're not anticipated, under the word anticipated, for mm. distribution of water for cooking or potentially drinking, human consumption, they would, uh, they would be considered to be exempt. But again, because of this presentation and the, uh, the antitrust, I have to quote, if it's not listed in the presentation, then certainly the uh, side of caution. My recommendation is contact your, uh, there are many of uh, premier faucet companies that each and every one of you are supporting that could more directly answer that question or has a better understanding of how it applies. But the law does not spell out shower valves, Chris. And there was one other valve, one other product you mentioned I can elaborate. I forgot what it was. I'm sorry. Hydrants. Hydrants. I guess in an emergency situation. Great question, Chris. Uh, that's one that uh, comes up multiple times every day. You'll have to default to the listing as it relates to anticipated usage. Currently, the interpretation I would have for a hydrant would be this, but I don't know where it's being installed, would be that it has a garden hose thread. The probability of it being used for outdoor irrigation or watering would be, would be just that, meaning that in that case, I would interpret that as meaning as long as I'm using it for one of those two types of uh, water distribution, I would not have to have a compliant product. However, uh, we as a company are offering both. And much of that is for the sake of the customer to give them options. But again, the two areas covered in the federal law would, meet, would, would tie to irrigation and for outdoor water dis distribution. In those cases, if m the interpretation would be this. As long as it's not for cooking, drinking, or human con consumption, it would not be affected by this. So it really comes down to how is that hydrant being used. Are they running a stainless steel hose that, was a, uh, that would have garden hose threads that would then go to a cooking pot that would be filling water for cooking purposes, then for sure it would have to comply. But if we're watering a garden, washing cars, outdoor, uh, you know, outdoor uh, workings around the house, that sort of thing, then that would not be for human consumption. And I think it's pretty clear as to how to interpret that. John, are, are, are some of what you've been talking about, do we anticipate that the EPA will address these questions more fully when they issue their compliance guidelines, which is anticipated to happen sometime in the, the third quarter, maybe the fourth quarter even of this year? Um, I've given a number of presentations uh, as to the question you're asking, Chris, and uh, you know, quite honestly, there, uh, there are many out there that when the mere mention of that, the time frame that's going to elapse to get to this point, 
that don't have a lot of faith that they're going to see something. But rumor has it third, fourth quarter this year, which means a guideline that specifically spells out what, what in a more detailed fashion is truly affected by this and what I could possibly uh, consider that I may not consider based upon the way the law is spelled out today. Again, err on the side of caution. That is your best bet. Okay. I've got one or two questions here about alloys. Um, one is silicon versus bismuth. Are, are the differences significant? Um, you know what, I have to be very cautious here, audience, that, that uh, there are companies out there using bismuth and I would not want to uh, affect them in any way negatively. I would tell you this, that in the silicon-based alloys, we can leave it at this. Uh, it's commonplace to find a steam listing or a steam rating, a WSP listing on a valve that's of a silicon nature. However, in the bismuth category, that may be very well a little more challenged. One seems to be more uh, more receptive to higher temp environments, meeting the uh, silicon. However, the bismuth has its advantages as well, where it solders. It's a little more friendly on the soldering side. I think much of this comes into play as to what manufacturer you're currently supporting and how they view the alloy they're selling. But I wouldn't want to have anybody walk away with a bias towards one alloy or the other. Uh, currently, um, much of what I see would be more in the lines of the silicon and the, uh, the binary alloys, which are a high copper content alloy for forging, seems to be of a, uh, growing in a big way throughout the uh, world of valves and fittings. But I wouldn't recommend that one versus the other uh, would be uh, would be, I think you need to gauge it from an application standpoint. But uh, silicon a little more difficult to solder, but it has advantages uh, as to how it, where and where and how it can be installed. Uh, the bismuth, on the uh, other hand, is a little friendlier to solder, but it has its limitations. What alloy is Legend using, and have you experienced any issues? Uh, alloys that we currently use um, are currently the silicon and we're using a binary alloy, we're not using the bismuth. And we've just found for the products that we market and sell, uh, our comfort level with those two alloys is very, very strong. But again, I can't, as, as it relates to the audience that we have today, I can't say anything negative about bismuth. I would just say this, that Chris asked me this question, what alloys do we use? It would be of two types, it would be a silicon, and it would be a, would be a binary alloy. Okay, I have one more question here. Sure. Um, it's, I've asked for clarification. Two inch plus only at main, after main, or any SIE valve? Uh, the way we would uh, describe that would be this, Chris, and how I would answer that would be, uh, I'm going to recommend that the law, uh, you can go to uh, the consortium's website. We have a website dedicated to this you'll have to get a copy of the law because right now you only have this to go on, which were the exemptions. Two-inch gate valves are larger. There is no spelling out of location, where it starts, because in large part, you could potentially, in a potable piping system, already existing, for example, that somebody went and made a renovation to, where they've got no lead and they've got, they've got non-compliant product and compliant in the same system. If it's not spelled out in the exemption list, in this case, I think we're going in the uh, category of saddles and, and valves. If it's spelled out in the exemption list, then, then you've, got a, you've got a safe path. If it's not spelled out specifically, and keep in mind, there's no identification with location as to where, it has to be in the exemptions, and you have to follow suit. You know, we've had questions at some of the training sessions, well, what if I go out and repair a, a backflow preventer, a large diameter that is of a non-compliant construction. Do I have to use do I have to use compliant replacement parts? My answer to that would be if I had to bridge that understanding, I would safely say that if I'm installing or replacing something on a potable piping system and it's not spelled out in the exemption list that it needs to be compliant. You know, we're hoping that uh, the detail as EP as the EPA would provide it will give us a lot greater understanding, but this herein lies the problem. There is only one and a quarter pages that define this law as to what you what you've seen and we've talked about today during this webinar. The detail is is very very vague, and uh, again, you can only take away with what's in print. And again, um, 
I would do I would do as little as possible in the way of interpreting, and I would do as much in the way of understanding. Drinking, cooking, anticipated human consumption, you're erring on the side of caution every step of the way. Otherwise, you could risk a legal issue that none of us would want to have to deal with. John, I have one last comment. One of the participants has uh, indicated they've heard of stress cracking with bismuth. Any reaction, observation that you um, would add to that? I would speak to this that um, you know many a year ago we used uh, we used bismuth in a product that we uh, that we uh, we distributed throughout the U.S. Um, I think bismuth has come a long way. I'm trying to put a positive spin on this. It's come a long way. I think there's been a lot of what I would call tweaking to the alloy. Uh, initially, how I would best describe what, what I personally witnessed on our part, nobody else's part but legends, is this. If I have a contractor that has a, uh, that's doing a potable piping system, the pipe diameters, for example, this is hypothetical, could range from half inch to one inch, three quarter inch to a quarter, all the way up to two inch, and I've got a contractor that's using maybe a uh, torch head that would be used on a large diameter pipe, for instance, inch and a half or two inch, because he wants to quickly and more efficiently solder a half or a three quarter inch valve because the heat distribution is much quicker and faster, and it works. It's a little more friendly working with some of the no lead products. Quick and rapid thermal expansion with bismuth can lead to cracking. I personally experienced that. It doesn't mean the alloy has not been tweaked or perfect where it's at, but I'm speaking a few years back what we personally experienced. All right, John, that takes care of the questions. I don't see any more being posted, so I guess we'll wrap this up. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation as well as for your responses to, to all of those questions. And, and thank you, welcome. everybody. Thank you, everybody, for uh, participating in today's webinar about the Reduction of Lead in Drinking Water Act. Again, this webinar has been recorded for replay, and all of you will receive a follow-up email message from me with notification as to when the replay is available, as well as instructions on how to access it and the presentation slides. Please be reminded that ASA's next webinar is scheduled to begin at 11 o'clock Eastern or 10 Central on this Thursday morning, April 11th. Our PHCP and industrial PVF economist, Alan Bolio with Industry Trends Research, will update members with his look ahead at macroeconomic and regional environments and specifically how they affect MWDA and ASA members. Key industry trends, interest rates, areas of concern, and where opportunities can be found will also be discussed. There will be ample opportunity for questions and answers, as well as for learning how each company can incorporate rate of change into their planning process. Please contact Ladelia Berger at lberger at asa.net to register. That's L-B-E-R-G-E-R -E at asa.net. Lastly, please mark your calendars to participate in MWDA's next event, the 2013 Executive Leadership Conference on June 17 and 18 at the Omni Hotel on Chicago's Magnificent Mile. The hotel reservation and event registration deadline is May 24th, and you will find complete information on the industry calendar available online at www.asa.net. I'm Chris Murin, Executive Director of MWDA and ASA, and this webinar is now concluded. Good morning. <laughs>